So welcome everyone. My name is Elena Pacenti and I serve as the Dean of the School of Design at New School of Architecture and Design. Um, while the guests are joining in, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, the day. And today I will be the moderator of this session. And before um, presenting our um, lecturers today, uh, let me explain a bit of uh, why we conceived this event and what's the uh, main objective and why we are having this conversation. Uh, first of all, this event has been conceived in occasion of the uh, World Usability Day, which is an, an event that happens all around the world around this uh, 24, 48 hours, November 10, 9 and 10. And um, and also as as it's organized by New School of Architecture and Design with uh, in collaboration con with the Interaction Design Foundation, and um, and when I when I will introduce our guest, uh, you'll see also the collaboration with another School of Design uh, in uh, in um, uh, Baja California. Um, we this this conversation is part of a series of lectures and discussions that New School has initiated, uh, in particular on uh, trying to um, discuss, analyze the role of uh, artificial intelligence and, in particular, generative AI and open AI solutions into the uh, field of uh, design, both in terms of how it impacts design methodologies and processes. Um, so in terms of tools, for instance, for ideation and for research. And on the other side also in terms of what is gonna be the next generation of product service systems that we as designers are going to design because AI is producing a extensive revolution and a change of what we have and we know as solutions and we have in front of us. So um, today we're going to try to discuss the role of AI as a tool. And obviously, none of us is a full expert. We are uh, learning and discussing. We are all educators and researchers. And so as we go and as we implement these tools uh, in our education practices and professional practices, we are discussing and critically thinking um, on, on the impact and the possibilities uh, of these um, tools and solutions. So um, today we're gonna discuss whether um, artificial intelligence solution and applications can contribute to some big issues that are uh, the design is confronting nowadays. Uh, issues about how to improve health, how to improve environment, how to improve inclusivity and inclusion, how to actually work on uh, users or people in a different way, which is truly more inclusive and potentially more interesting for the generation of new solutions. So today we're gonna have uh, Tiziana D'Agostino, who is a new school uh, of architecture and design faculty. She teaches in the um, product design program and in graphic design and interactive media program, where we have um, a full uh, concentration and track on the design of digital products and experiences. She's also part of uh, the Interaction Design Foundation as San Diego leader of the foundation and also a UX psychology consultant. Uh, Tiziana is gonna present um, uh, our, um, present, uh, our first lecture today. And the second guest speaker is Alejandro uh, Murga. I always, uh, I don't do the full name. I say Alejandro Murga who is an industrial design researcher. He's actually conducting his PhD right now and is a, a faculty member professor at the uh, um, Department of Technology Engineer, Engineering Society Sciences at the Baja California University, University of the Autonoma de la Baja California. I don't speak Spanish yet, I'm working on it. Um, with Alejandro, 
uh, we are planning um, uh, a series of events where New School and the Università Autonoma della Banca California are going to cooperate specifically with the with departments of industrial design and interaction design during the World Design Capital 2024 series of events um, where we will be proud to promote what our disciplinary fields can offer to the bigger conversation on the innovation of our region cross border. So San Diego Tijuana is gonna be the center of World Design Capital for 2024. With that said, and no further ado, I'm gonna leave the floor to Tiziana for her presentation. Thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna have a Q&A session and we're gonna have, if you want to post questions during the presentation, feel free to post it in the chat. We're gonna have a Q&A session after the presentation or at the end of both. Thank you again for joining and hope you enjoy the day. Right. Well, thank you, Elena. So I'm excited to be part of this event um, because I feel that AI is everywhere. And I'm sure you noticed that as well. And uh, I really strongly believe that it can be harnessed for the greater good. So today we'll discover some of the ways AI technology are being used to improve the user experience and to make the world a better place for all. First, we're going to talk about a little bit of ter terminology, some of the risk and real harms associated with AI. But most importantly, we'll talk about the possibility, how AI can improve AUX or user experience and how can improve um, the world. So I had to start with disclaimer, like Elena mentioned, I'm not an expert. There really are no experts because the technology changes literally every day. I am a learner and I've been really interested in the topic for a while. So um, so I definitely um, really excited about it. But like I said, I'm not an expert. Also wanna make sure everybody understand that there is no true, uh, absolute truth. Things change every day. There are no wrong answer in a debate. Um, and also we are not fortune tellers. So I have no idea what's gonna happen in the future. So I'm only going to speak from what's happening right now. So before we even start, I want to make sure we understand different terminology because those terms sometimes are throughout um, and used interchangeably. So I want to make sure we all have the same understanding. So an algorithm is simply a precise set of rules that specify how a machine should solve a problem. So I'm not telling you what to do step by step. I'm just giving you some rule. I'm just giving you some rule that will allow you to solve a problem. AI or artificial intelligence technically should be an artificial system or systems able to perform independently and doing tasks that only a human privately could do versus machine learning or student systems that use an algorithm to find patterns in data and use them for future prediction. So to be really specific, what we're talking about today is mainly machine learning. However, machine learning doesn't sound as great as AI. So the two terms gonna be used interchangeably, but it's important to understand that if a real artificial intelligence does not exist right now. So, but I will use both terms interchangeably. In fact, I'm probably gonna use AI just because it sounds better. So it's important to understand that AI is everywhere. And you've been interacting with AI or machine learning for a very, very long time, even if you may not have noticed. So if you ever receive a recommendation from Amazon or Netflix or any company, you have been interacting with machine learning and AI. But obviously in the past couple of years, uh, the development has been accelerating and is improving more and more and more. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that means right. that more services <laughs> and products will Normal. soon become not just smart, but also intelligent, at least more intelligent than what they are right now. So I love this quote from, um, you know, from uh, Arthur Clarke, which is yeah, a I science fiction writer. Um, and he basically came up with three laws, and this is probably the most famous one. They say any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
And this is really what happening right now, because as you every time you go and look at things related to AI, you usually see the little sparkling star, almost like a symbol of magic, right? Disney magic. Uh, and this is because really AI right now, it almost looks like magic. It's not, but it almost looks like magic. But we have to understand that AI is not as intelligent yet. First of all, it's very biased because it amplify and perpetuate the biases found in its training data set. So we all have biases, some we are conscious of, some we're not. And obviously those biases get transferred in AI system. You also hallucinate. That means it will generate false information and create non-existing sources. This sounds very real, real but they're not. And is now able to reason. This is very, very important because it's easy to fool us that AI can actually make decision and decision making and reasoning, but it's really not because it's simply a complex pattern recognition and prediction machine. So let's see an example of each of them. So this was an exercise I did in October. So only a couple of weeks ago, and I asked um, uh, Stable Diffusion, which is the AI engine behind FreePick AI image generator, to give me an example of an image of a doctor. And sure enough, it came up with four white guy with a beard, uh, middle age or all. Then I asked to give me an image of a nurse. And sure enough, we get a woman, mainly a white woman, really pretty, and this is the default idea that stable diffusion has about nurses. So where are all the other people, the people of color? Well, never fear. As soon as I ask for a domestic worker, that's where stable diffusion decide to bring me some people of color. So obviously those are huge biases. Obviously this is something needs to be worked on and this is something needs to be fought. But just like, AI right now speed out a bunch of biases can also be trained to fight biases. If part of the data set is information about typical biases, then we can build an engine to fight them. Another example is hallucination. This is, um, it was actually really fun. I asked ChatGPT to give me some resources about the future of design and design for a better future. And out of four resources, two of them don't exist. And they look very realistic, right? A TED talk called Designing for a Better Future by Niti Ban. That sounds realistic. Sure enough, it doesn't exist. And when I told uh, ChatGPT that those resource, the resources don't exist, ChatGPT was kind of defensive. So he apologized by said that, well, the resources should exist in some form, at least up to September 2021 when I was last trained, which is also another issue. Uh, the ChatGPT uh, 3.5, which is the free version that most people use, uh, stops at, I believe, April 2022 now, but is not up to date. The newer version are more up to date, but not the one that most people use uh, for free. And finally, this is probably even more concerning, is the fact that AI do not reason, don't think. This is uh, my AI, which is an AI companion that is available um, in Snapchat to all users, can be customized and created almost like a video game character. And uh, the scary part of this is that it sounds exactly like a real person, but because it's not a real person, it can give you really, really bad advice. In one example, some technologists did a, um, a trial uh, in March or April in which the AI was giving advice to this fictional kid uh, on how to cover bruises when the CPR was coming uh, so they could hide the fact that their parents were beating them which of course, this is absolutely outrageous. The example I have here is much more benign. I did it with my son's chat GP3, but still it shows you that there is no reasoning. Uh, I pretended to be a 16 year old boy dating a 23 year old girl and uh, concern about the age gap. And beside a just brief consideration about legal implication, um, the content was like, well, at the end it's up to you to decide what feels right which of course is definitely an issue because it's not possible. You shouldn't be dating a 16 year old if you're 23. And there are a few other challenges because first of all is developed commercially. 
they're really even open AI is really not open source. Uh, it is strongly funded by Microsoft. Also, um, it is supercharging misinformation. We are seeing a lot of this during the um, for the Middle Eastern uh, conflict that's going on right now. A lot of misinformation, a lot of fake images. In fact, Adobe just got caught selling AI generated images of the conflict. Um, which is, of course, is absolutely unethical. And uh, it can also increase injustice and inequality. Facial recognition software that many police departments are using, at least in the United States, um, are very flawed to the point a few months ago, a eight months, um, eight months pregnant woman was arrested incorrectly due to facial recognition as a suspect in a burglary. And I don't know you, but when I was eight months pregnant, the last thing I want to do is go rob a convenience store. And finally, it can make workplace, workplace diversity much harder because if we're using AI to find the best candidate, the problem is it will reinforce the stereotype based on historical data. So diversity has never been a, you know, a strong suit on most companies, at least in the United States. And so if you look at historical data, it will constantly reinforce the fact that good worker looks in a specific way or are of a specific ethnicity or gender. However, I want to talk about the good stuff. I don't only want to worry about the harms because a lot of people are talking about it, but I want to focus on the positive. So AI can be leveraged for good for many, many, many reasons. And what's really important and what is really crucial to remember is that AI is just a tool. It's not intelligent on its own. It's just a tool and is in its infancy. That means we can and should influence its development as designer uh, and curb his abuses and biases. So we need human skill to rein in abuses and to give some ethical training to our AI. We need better user experience for the tool. ChatGPT is not really the best user experience if you ever try it. We need designers to build future products that are gonna be powered by AI. And we need to embrace its potential and co to collaborate to create a world where we all wanted to live in. So how can we do that? How can we leverage um, AI and design, for example? Well, AI can be a wonderful companion and help us speed up the work when we're creating design. It can take over tedious tasks, leaving more space for creative endeavor. For example, it can, we can use AI to create automatically um, a description for our images for accessibility purpose, which is really not the most exciting thing to do, but is absolutely important. It can also help us um, give us new insights because it can analyze a large set of data and find new patterns that human may miss. That's what computers are really good at, to find patterns in a huge amount of data. And this is what humans are really bad at. They can also help us get better user experience because AI can help us simplify and optimize, for example, language for a better understanding. It generate or generate better questions for usability testing. So just show you a couple of examples how we can apply that. Uh, this was an image I created uh, for a campaign on domestic against domestic violence. The image was um, obviously heavily retouched in Photoshop and it was cropped. And I found myself in need of finding a full image. I didn't know, uh, wanted to go back and add all those changes to the original image, which you can see here. So I used Photoshop generative field to actually fill in the area I was missing. And as you can see, it did a pretty decent job. It's not identical to the original image, but it's pretty darn close. The only thing you can notice that's very different is the necklace. But even then, even if the necklace is different, it still looks pretty realistic. So this is just one way in which you can do that. Uh, you can also use it as an ideation partner. The Nielsen Norma Group wrote a wonderful article called AI as a UX Assistant, in which he mentioned that 
generative AI can support us by acting both as content editor, research assistant, ideation partner, and design assistant. As far as ideation is concerned, it can help us, for example, of exploring different variation of our content. Um, even more important, it will be able to uh, ideate potential scenario and solution, and even maybe estimated what could be unintended consequences of our design. It can help us role play so that we can ask it to be a stakeholder or a specific persona. It can also help a validating an idea and maybe even identify gaps in our design. And also it can help us create a better experience. This is a page from a government site. And if you ever dealt with any US government site, uh, you know how horrible that could be. It, this is the page about rights and responsibility, which you have to agree to. Those are 23 bullet points written in a very, very small type, one after the other. And I can promise you, nobody will ever read that, but you do have to agree to them. So how can we use um, AI to make it better? Well, I went to ChatGPT and I copy all that content and I say, please simplify this for a 10 year old. Don't skip anything. And so what ChatGPT did, took all this really complex text and simplify it in a very simple language. Now, I understand that there are legal requirements for certain texts, but what about using what ChatGPT created as a headline so that it gives you kind of a really brief summary of all these legalese so that whoever's reading it can in the immediately understand what each of this paragraph actually say. And by asking to put a check mark next to it, it will guarantee you at least improve the chances of me at the very least reading the first word or the first couple of words. So obviously it will give me a much better experience and a better compliance as well. Even more exciting is all the thing that AI can do for solving global problems because AI could compensate for human limitation and even help us achieve the UN sustainable goals that were set up uh, by, of course, the United Nations. In fact, the United Nations decided that AI is so important that he created an AI advisory board in October, on October 26, so just a few days ago, <clears throat> to advise on the risk, opportunity, and even international governance of artificial intelligence to make sure that we develop the tools we need. For example, AI can help us with the environment by supercharging our battle to fight the damaging effect of climate change and to preserve the environment, can help us in healthcare, either by analyzing a large set of data and diagnose our condition and much, much faster than a human doctor in many cases. Also, it can help us with inclusion and equity because it can increase capability and opportunities for the most vulnerable position. So let me show you a couple of examples for each of this category. And those are just three, but there are so many other um, that I could have talked about. As far as the environment is concerned, ellipsis.earth uh, harness the power of machine learning and real world data to create ecosystem from environmental change. Most of the description I took from their own website, so don't get mad at me, they're really kind of convoluted. Um, but just you know, in short of words, what uh, this company does is able to create very, very detailed um, uh, analysis about, for example, trash, like in this case. And this, me this methodology was used both in um, India and Bangladesh and in Ecuador on the Galapagos um, Island. And this uh, particular type of uh, data about litter convince the government to pass uh, a nationwide single-use plastic ban. So that's obviously a great result. And now the companies working with AI to improve the environment is TreeSwift that makes forests easier to manage by providing actionable, reliable, and trustworthy data on every tree so that the manager of the forest can actually make more informed decisions. This is another project um, I have 
consulted with uh, that's actually being developed here in San Diego at the UCSD Supercomputer Center. The application is called Burn Pro 3D, still under development, but the goal is to model all sort of possible conditions so that fire manager are going to be able to create burn plants uh, to have uh, responsible burning so that you can lighten up the fuels and avoid damaging wildfire. And one more for the environment uh, is powered by IBM. IBM is a whole section of AI for social group, uh, good. And I really love how they're talking about augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. And augmented intelligence, honestly, is a much better um, description what it does. So it's not taking over for humans, but augment the human intelligence. Um, and this is one of the many projects they're working on. And this helps addressing climate risk in Africa with AI and the hybrid cloud. So um, that will help with the the damaging effect of climate change. As far as healthcare is concerned, there are lots and lots of projects. I really love this one because even though it is still in the testing phases and prototype phase, I am a designer at heart and I couldn't resist such beautiful design. Uh, but the Smart A kit is not just beautiful. What it is, is a small box that will contain four different tools that will help patients or people in general to triage their condition themselves. So it could be available in any public space, just like the, the defibrillator are available right now. And it would allow you to check your eyes, your skin for cancer or your lung capacity as well as your heartbeat. Um, and that could be obviously deployed everywhere. So it would be a really, really awesome way to democrat democratize um, healthcare. Uh, another uh, use case that's very much used right now is diagnostic, more advanced diagnostic. So, for example, uh, there is a AI uh, system called CADU, C -A -D -U, uh, they use AI to support doctors in identifying can cancer tissue in um, esophagus. So, is looking for esophageal cancer. One other program was able to successfully detect breast cancer in a woman four years before it was um, it actually developed to a level where a human would be able to detect it. And my favorite example um, is actually a story of a family who has a three-year-old experienced a lot of pain, but doctor had no answer to why. Um, to why that was it. They saw 17 different specialists, nobody could find an answer. And ChatGBT was actually able to come up with the correct diagnosis once her mom, his mother, was able to enter all the different symptoms and ChatGPT find the right diagnosis. This is amazing. Not that we all should use ChatGPT to diagnose our condition, but again, we're talking about augmented intelligence. This is really, really nice. Um, two other programs, as far as healthcare is concerned, they're using AI. One is still um, supported by IBM, and the IBM research uh, created the first machine learning model to predict which patient would be more likely to get addicted. Um, to, for example, opioids. Another really interesting use of this technology is also something called uh, a discovery engine called the Benevolent Platform that allow you to discover biomedical data that can be used in generating new medication. And the future of healthcare, if we really want to be effective, it really will be to create specialized drugs that are personalized to your own genome and to your own physical conditions. Um, and my last topic is inclusion and equity. Again, there's a lot of different options out there, but I really enjoyed this one. Um, it's called LEQ and is an actual AI companion uh, designed to support and accompany, especially older adults, but I can see being applied to a lot of other um, group of people to live independently. Uh, this companion only keeps them company and entertain them, but also have a variety of different um, application for uh, keeping uh, people healthier and safer when living by themselves. This is another program that's available right now. It's called Textio. It's much simpler, but it can do a huge difference 
with uh, in inclusion and equity. This particular application allow you to enter your text and watch it, uh, read it and analyze to see if you're using any kind of exclusive languages or languages full of biases. And you will highlight it and give you suggestion on how to make it um, biases free and in using inclusive language. And finally, this is an app uh, called Be My Eyes. This has actually been around for a long time, is an app uh, that connects people with vision disability to uh, people they can see. And uh, they are usually volunteer. And then when you, they need, uh, the person with disability needs to have someone either read a sign or describe a scene that will contact one of those volunteer that will describe for them. But now, Be My Eyes is actually being powered by AI and therefore is gonna be a lot more available because you don't have to rely on a volunteer to be there to explain what you've seen. AI would actually do the work for you. So those are just a few of the cases uh, in which you can use, that you can use AI for good, but I encourage you to research it because there's so many that really make you optimistic about the future. And I wanna close with this quote from Anne Maria Grisogno, who wrote a great book, uh, paper on using leveraging AI for good. Um, and I think you really kind of sum up the state of things where we are right now. So we are rushing into a future that we can barely imagine, but we need to look ahead with as much clarity as we can master and embrace the present opportunity we have to shape the trajectory and use it to face the risk. The window is not very big. This is the time in which we can still influence how AI is going to be developed before it's gonna run off and be out of our hands. So that's what I encourage all of you, just get informed, look at the amazing thing that's being done right now, and let's all work together to use AI for creating a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Tiziana. Mm -hmm. Wonderful presentation. And um, I see in the audience many uh, professional people who are studying <laughs> AI as well. And uh, it's extremely, uh, extremely difficult to, uh, to provide a portrait of what's going on. The, the level of complexity, as you all see, is is uh, very very high and uh the even the, the collection of the, the the case studies and trying to understand what the implication possible implications are is extremely complex which reflect which put us to reflect on our role as designers because um these the, when revolutions of this entity happened designers are called in into question to because we contribute to the design of this. So no matter what, our role as designer is to mediate from what is technologically possible and what makes sense for people and environment and society. So we, we hold a very big responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter what, uh, we, if, whether we participate in the design of the big systems or the small solution, we do represent um, and we do have the responsibility of designing according to the values and trying to understand the complexity that we bring in. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the second level of the reflection, which is, as designer, uh, designers and educators, what can we do, right, to actually uh, reflect on our role uh, reflect on how implement, include, uh, adopt these new tools, the way we design, the way we teach design, um, and on the bigger conversation or debate on what design is all about. And um, with that said, I, I leave the floor to Alejandro for um, his presentation, which is much more focused on the discipline of um, uh, design, both industrial and interaction. As I said at the very beginning, we do believe that our field 
um, includes both the design of artifacts that physical and digital and as as long as when we go into the digital obviously we embrace complex service product service systems so uh, alejandro has experience on uh, on uh, on these aspects and uh, is going to contribute with some thoughts and some experiments is doing in class right now about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will present right now. I'm very uh, deeply touched and honored to, to be invited by Elena Tiziana to participate. Uh, I have no words. So uh, I'll try to do my best since English is not my, uh, <laughs> my first language but I will try it. So what, what I'm about to do is to, to talk about uh, interaction in design uh, mediated by technology and how can we appropriate the, the interaction design field to make subversive interactions, uh, subversive relationships, human relations, because design is about that, you know, um, design has a social dimension. It always had this social dimension. It has the mindset of the project, project as visualizing future, taking the present and reimagining what it could be into the future. So with that in mind, we can, we have to recognize that we, in our uh, mindset, we have some biases that are uh, uh, fed up or built uh, throughout this culture, culture that can be dominant, that can be hegemonic. So in that way, I, I will talk a, a little bit about myself. I'm an architect, but my master's degree is in industrial design. And I right now I'm doing a PhD at Palermo University in Argentina, trying to figure out how the role of the representation, human representation takes part in the design process. So with that in mind, I want to present a gene genealogy of the notion of human in design. What do we mean with human? What do we mean with human-centered design? What is at, at the center of design and how we theorize it? So Cooley in, the, in 1989, uh, brought out the social aspects, the dignity, unions, and rights within the technological view of work. If we want to design work environment, how do we introduce technology? Which are the social aspects of that? So that's what Cooley talked about. And then Norman Draper, uh, I, I think it's a genius that they thought about the user participation in the design process. And later on, they called humans or people because user is uh, problematic in the sense, how can you talk about a product if it's not yet designed? How can you talk about user? They are not using anything yet. So by telling people they are users or potential users, you are expecting them to use your own technology that you are designing. So this is a very impositive view. So, but if you call them humans or you uh, call them people, what is the relationship with the materiality? So we can uh, risk of losing the material relationship. What can we do with that? Then uh, Coopers and Bowers uh, called out or pointed out that user is a discursive structure. Any concept is a discurs discursive structure that can be far from the reality, far from real subjects. So we need to consider what is real and what is representation or how do people take part in the represent, representation of humans? So Schumann talk, talks about representation strategies in design. So we need to take out these strategies and acknowledge them as representation strategies. And with that in mind, we can take out or uh, visualize which are the biases that we're working with. So interaction is it in itself a kind of representation. When I talk about inclusion, integration, uh, and these re these representations, these are not humans. These are uh, merely drawings, color. You, you don't talk, uh, walk in the street and find people that are colored in blue or pink or, no, these are representations. And these representations makes biases of how do we see each other as equal or as different. So this is very important. 
Corona Martinez argues that the designer invents something, uh, the object in the act of its representation. So we, when we design, when we draw, when we make our uh, sketches, we're inventing something, we're inventing a reality, we're inventing relationships, relationships with materials, we're invent inventing the future. So this is very important and very po uh, powerful, I think. Uh, so representation in design is a project in itself. So we can acknowledge the language performativity because as Tiziana said, the, the words are very important. So if I'm speaking in English or in Spanish or in non another language, that matters. So for instance, the, the, the alt text that identifies images in internet is mostly in English. That means something. So when I use ChatGPT, when I use the, the AI generator with images, uh, the images that will be presented to me are mostly based on English thinking, which is in a framework of a cultural reality and so on and so forth. So we can we need to acknowledge that the, the dominant language in the image representation is in English. So with that in mind, we can manage to transform, to manipulate, and to make those representations uh, according to the culture that we are assessing, that we are approaching. And uh, performance can be seen as a way of counter visualization. So um, I don't know how to say it, so uh, representation is a way to uh, legitimize identities. And identities are problematized in a postmodern studies, in the postmodern studies as something that is not natural, something that is not fixed, something that is has a dynamic. So we don't talk anymore about identity, we talk about ways of identification. So with the representation, we are establishing, we are designing ways of identification. And if those ways of ID identification do not include people that can have something to say about the ways of representation or identifying, we're uh, generating our own biases and we are legitimizing those biases. So uh, performance can be a strategy to counter visualize contemporary visual and symbolic conventions of the other considered as natural. So with that in mind, we have done some interesting exercises, don't mind the images, <laughs> at our school to, to uh, reflect on how language works, how the sign language works in representation, not only our own language, doesn't matter if it's English or Spanish, how the sign language work and how some identity categories such as man, woman works in the representation. As Tiziana said, we put woman uh, or man and immediately shows our uh, hegemonic representations, white male, white female, and so on and so forth. So we can manage to manipulate language in order to make more precise representations, right? Um, but also we can say that it's not only the language, it's the participation of people. People have some uh, situated knowledge, have some experiences that are valid, have some symbolic goods, and cultural materials that can bring to the design process to configure representations and, and be accepted as a possible reality. So I'm working right now in my PhD thesis with drag performance in Tijuana, and we need to consider how do these people represent themselves through social media, uh, throughout their perfor performances, throughout their own enunciation, because it's more complex than uh, a he, him, she, her. Uh, it's more than that. People identify as something else. So we need to consider language. We need to consider images. We need to consider representation. And how does this material, cultural material, circulates in culture? 
And I, I have in my PhD thesis done some exercises with ChatGPT. How can you, with ChatGPT, how can you design a drag persona using Mexican cultural knowledge? And I found out that maybe it uses drag language that is common in the United States, but it's often in English. So it, it fails to acknowledge which are the words uh, that LGBTQ community in Mexico and different parts of Mexico as well use and circulate in the culture. So uh, it, it makes a note. Remember that these are examples and examples of, of the jargon and the expressions that circulate in the LGBTQ community, but the LGBT community is diverse and it can vary from people to people. So uh, with that in mind, we need to consider real people. And we have different approaches and these are from the Interaction Design Foundation. I have taken them, the empathy map, the persona profile, and we can make image iterations with the uh, artificial artificial intelligence and then go to the field and take out photographs with this in mind to make observations, situated observations, intelligent and smart observations about how the interaction occurs in, in the field and then configure that reality in the using the tools. This is an example of the empathy map with real people and with the AI images. And what we found with this exercise with the students is that uh, we found out that some scenarios or some interactions were not considered previously. So we needed to generate new categories, new scenarios, new interactions. We need to consider them. And also understand the idea of normalcy because the, the chat GPT and also the AI uh, image generators have the dominant dominant idea of normalcy, what is normal. But these specialized groups, these uh, groups made of real people have certain ideas of what is normal for them. So we need to consider that and to 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 be a part of of those biases that the 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 AI provide us. And with that in mind to adjust the user persona and make it more situated, more more contextualized. So this approach pretends to find out which are the cultural materials and symbolic goods that the agents manipulate and provide to consider in the design process. This helps to define the technological and hedonistic terms in which humans interact. So for me, uh, this has been a recent research, uh, as you can see. For me, this has been very powerful because the, I think the anti artificial intelligence is not, is not a risk. It's why uh, it helps us open our eyes of our own minds, what happens in within our own minds and how we take for granted some stereotypes, so uh, some representations of the human beings and uh, of us as well. So uh, I think it's a very exciting moment to talk about how we represent human people in the design process and the AI help us to make it obvious, to make it uh, uh, manageable in order to, to talk about. So previous previously, we couldn't take this discussion and make it obvious because we didn't uh, know how to uh, make a, 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 a translation from text to image before we did it, that ourselves. So with the, the AI, we can make it that happen and reflect about our own uh, stereotypes and prejudice. And that's it, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope I, I, I could reach to the point of reflection. Thank you, Alejandro, I think you did. And thank you for the deep uh, thoughts and um, to, to bring the conversation back to uh, one of the main the fun foundations of our work which is really reflecting on on this um, on how we ourselves represent um, uh, humans and what's the, the meaning of that foundative concept and in in even though these two um, 
presentation where uh, atta attacking the um, ample, ample wide discussion from very different points of view. What is very um, impressive for me is that we are moving in a very constructive way into understanding this aspect that you just mentioned, Alejandro, which is really uh, using the, the, the words that Tiziana uh, introduced as an augmented way of uh, re doing the things that um, we, we have done to, to think about product service systems that exist already and can be improved or uh, thinking about the next generation of uh, of systems, but also really using it to rethink the methodologies themselves because yes, these tools can help uh, us um, breaking some of the prejudices, the stereotypes that we apply, even when we think that we are designing and representing our the people and our issues in a correct way. So thank you very much. This was uh, really uh, a lot and profound. And uh, I would now um, open up the floor for the conversation. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask uh, you, Alejandro, actually, uh, since I know a little bit uh, your work and we are um, organizing these meetings between our classes in the product design programs, et cetera, is, um, the, the, the example of uh, your uh, design with your students on the uh, kids with um, um, autism and if how the, the uh, let's say, uh, personas generated uh, through the AI and the actual observations, if uh, how that brought to some uh, new insights. Funny. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I would like to start, Elena, with uh, with some reflection. I think what we need to reflect on is that uh, it doesn't matter what we design. No, it doesn't matter what. The, that's not the question. The question is how. No, because tomorrow there will be new technologies. Tomorrow there will be new needs of new objects. So how is is the the problem within the design field. And uh, I think it's very interesting because it it, it uh, makes us to reflect on a philosophical way. And also I would like to talk about the, these exercises with my students uh, of industrial design. They are designing uh, interactive devices for sensorial places, uh, sensorial rooms for autistic people within uh, schools, specialized schools for, for uh, neurodiversity and uh, and so on. So um, I applied this exercise with my, my students to make them see what they are missing out in their own observations. Because also if you, if you talk about autistic people, uh, Maybe they are not able to communicate their own ideas of self-representation, but they are they are uh, surrounded by their parents, by their teachers, by their friends, by the the support group that can uh, input something interesting in their present representations. And also, uh, it's not just. Uh, talking with them and asking them, how do you self-represent? Is doing this cognitive walkthrough about which are my biases? How do you use technology to, to represent or not those biases? And with that in mind, go to the field and observe because see is not the same to observe. Observe is to acknowledge in which position are you taking this visual information? So if you don't do the exercise before you you go to field, you don't know what to see. You don't know how to process those that information. And with these tools, the empathy map, the persona design, the user journey, and the reflection of that those biases, you can go to field and take photographs, do uh, interviews with the users, and then take that information and make new categories and reflect about which is going to be this new reality I want to work on 
because this, this is yet to exist. So the categories are yet to exist, are yet to, to be implemented with, with those people. Uh, this, this in other fields, for instance, psychology or educational field, they uh, regard us as mad people because they, they tell us, how do you do this cognitive walkthrough? You teach these concepts and then you apply them with your students at the same time. It's crazy. So I think uh, design fields is uh, that that project things uh, have this very big advantage to s build knowledge and to make it happen in the world. We we are privileged to do that with a philosophical thinking and reflect about our own knowledge. How are thinking? How are we thinking about design, and how are we building knowledge of design? And uh, for me, it's very powerful. Uh, every design workshop for me, it's a uh, new knowledge, new learning for me and also for my students. But I, I'm talking about myself. I think uh, I have six, I have six years of being professor at Baja University and each workshop has been different. Each design problem has, <laughs> has been different. And also uh, this, it's very recent that we have worked with real people. Uh, before the traditional education was idealizing, which is your user, which is your idealized user, and generating these absurd stories about people that don't exist and don't connect with re with real people. And now we have the opportunity to be, uh, for instance, working with Camtecate, which is the, the education center where these these kids are, and. Uh, the teachers, the kids, the families are so excited to work with us. As you know, Elena, as you know, Tiziana, product design, industrial design only exists in New School of Architecture and Design and with us. There are very few people and also in other universities, but they are regarded as engineering or they are regarded as something else. But there are very few people in Tijuana, San Diego, California and, and, and Baja California working on product design with a mindset of design design as a project, design as a social project that transforms reality. This is a very big responsibility. It's it, not the it's not the fault of AI. Is <laughs> we need to take the responsibility of how are we working with. Absolutely. And thank you for mentioning and to bring the conversation back to the classroom and education in design, because you are correct. Um, whether design is considered is very large term, uh, the, 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 the discipline rooted into design of uh, product uh, and system, call it industrial design, call it product design, call it. Uh, obviously, I'm from Italy, as is Tiziana. She has studied in the U.S., I fully studied in Italy, Polytechnic University of Milan and Domus Academy later. And we do have a very strong uh, disciplinary foundation and a culture that come from a different world of design. It's just called progetto, progettare, which is from Latin pro iacere, which means project. Uh, uh, so uh, foreseeing, you know, looking ahead looking at what does not yet exist is envisioning, right? So these are very strong. That, that's why for us, that the, the disciplinary roots are very important. And back to the classroom, you are completely correct. Um, in, in design programs of this kind, you have to provide the opportunity to the students to use, to work with the users, to work with real cases, to work with the community, to do this uh, continuous exercising on the methodologies and how and, and iterate as much as is possible in a simulating situation like a classroom, right? With the time, with the constraints. Um, and that's where I think our responsibility, even with the adoption of these new tools is to really embrace it, uh, them ahead of time and experiment and expose the students to them to them um, as part of their ability, a toolkit, first of all, and ability to use them to further 
um, exploit the, 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 the skills and, and knowledge and capabilities. Um, Tiziana, I don't know if, if uh, the audience have questions. I'm not checking, I haven't checked the, um, thank you, Melissa, for your link. Um, I haven't checked the chat uh, after that. So um, if there are questions, please uh, raise your hand or put it in the, in the chat. Meanwhile, I'd like to, <clears throat> to, go, ba to go back to Tiziana and mm -hmm. on this uh, bigger picture yeah. of uh, the, the ethical conversation around AI and the new applications and et cetera. Um, what do you see as the um, reaction of the government or the um, the regulation side of uh, the picture uh, talking about, uh, you know, ethical implication mm -hmm. of this? Well, I think, yeah, it's a great question because nobody has the right answer. So that's kind of you know, part of the problem that nobody has a solution, one, one solution. But um, what is people are doing now is number one, talking about it, which I feel, <clears throat> excuse me, is a very good sign because during the time of social media, when social media was introduced, nobody talked about it. Nobody even considered that there could be some unintended consequences. Um, and we all know that there were. So I feel that it is definitely a very good sign that people are talking about it as AI is getting developed. And right now, um, the latest uh, updates right now is that um, Europe launched the something called the UI Act, uh, the AI Act, as a proposal in 2021. So it's always been very much on the forefront. Um, so has been so far passed on in the Parliament is not obviously still a working document that it will kind of establish some rules of conduct around developing AI. But even more exciting that just last week, um, it, the G7 meeting, um, many countries, the G7 plus the European community agreed on an 11 point code of conduct. Um, around UI. And one thing I was very excited about it is probably um, the point, I think eight or nine, I don't remember which one, uh, but basically they were saying that the main focus of AI development it should be to solve problems and improve the world. So, and at the same time, in fact, I think pro maybe the exact same day, um, Biden in the United States uh, released an executive order on the same topic of AI development is a lot more complex, uh, but he's pretty much highlighting the same things as in there should be transparency, there should be cooperation between all countries as far as sharing information um, and uh, obviously creating some kind of guardrails so that we can stop the possible harms in the technology, as well as you know privacy and all those other ethical concerns. Now, of course, those are just declaration right now. There is no like laws that are being set up yet. Uh, and there's plenty of people complaining, of course, but, um, uh, but that is still for me a positive sign because it still means that people are talking about it earlier than we did, um, uh, than you would did. Thank you, Melissa, for she posted the link to the executive order. If you're in the US, if you wanna read about it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think it's a great thing because nobody really had the answer, but it's important to understand. And one of the biggest problem with AI right now is that it is a black box, even for people that develop the AI. So people that are developing all those AI technology, they know what they put in, they know what gets out, but they still can't tell how the machine, the system, the algorithm came up with the answer. That's still a black box. And this is what the big problem is. There is not enough transparency, also because right now the way those systems are built don't have transparency. It's almost you know, when you're in school, you have to show your work, you know, when you're learning math, um, it's kind of the same problem here. You get the problem, you get the solution, but you don't know how it reached to that solution. 
And that's definitely a problem because if we don't know how that happens, we can't stop the negative part. And the only, and the other thing too is I feel there should be more like actual regulation because the smarter, quote unquote, those um, machines becomes, the more people will trust them. As in like, oh, they're just like human, they're perfect. And they will like stop doubting what they find. I mean, already is impossible to tell if an image is generated by AI or not. Um, I mean, there are some images you can tell, but I seriously, I did a test, I took a test and I couldn't tell which one was a real one and which one was AI. So, and I deal with images all day. So <laughs> that's a problem. And he's already showing as a huge problem everywhere. And next year is gonna be a big election year in US. That's gonna definitely be a big problem. But on the other hand, AI possibly can help that way. And uh, if there are good rules. So you can use AI to spot misinformation instead of distribute misinformation. It's just a question that you have to train it to that. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, without any kind of government oversight, that's not going to happen because the company developing them are for profit. And so they're releasing things regardless because it's like a big race now. Is it Google going to come up with the next one or is it going to be OpenAI or is it going to be Meta? And so there is no, dis you know, on that side, you can't trust those company to do the best that you know they can do, and you can see the history. You don't need a prediction machine to see that in the past they didn't really develop with the best interest of people in mind. Very good, thank you. So <laughs> it brings back to the to the to the role of you know design and designers on the bigger picture, and obviously it is in no one's power to influence the 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 development at the uh, political and bigger economic uh, level so the conversation goes back on as designers as practitioners and as educators and what actually can we do to we can do to act to um, embrace uh the the challenges and identify the opportunities and somehow uh, introduce a acceptable level of this complexity in every project we do so how do we deal with this complexity in the projects we do and um so both working with students and in practice it's a matter of uh, really uh, in my opinion, goes back to the amount of research that we have to execute and diligently and uh, to be always informed. And that's why I totally agree with you, Tiziana. It's very positive to see that the conversation started because other very invisible revolution, technological revolution happened under our eyes without the necessary amount of uh, conversation and research and, and due diligence. So um, how do you, Tiziana, uh, expose, for instance, the student, designer students to these issues? Well, obviously depending on which class it is, but um, ethic is always the foundation. And Honestly, my classes, ethic is always a foundation, regardless of which class it is, because I think is important. And when it comes to AI, is even more important. So I really think that you should be aware of it. You should be using it. I try to incorporate it as appropriate in the in the curriculum, because without understanding and without literacy, you're not gonna be able to discern the risk. Uh, but we also spend a lot of time analyzing the feeling, quote unquote, of AI. So it's never like a one-sided conversation. So we discuss about the biases. I show the biases. We can do exercises together as in like, okay, let's try to type something in. Let's see what the prompt come up mm -hmm. so that you at least start getting some more critical sense about right now what to do. And, uh, and also, I mean, 
I feel that there is the need of a conversation about those kind of topics. So um, I was actually really kind of saddened to read while I was uh, researching all the text of the executive order or the, you know, the G7 agreement. Um, there were a lot of articles in like, oh, Biden executive order going to be embed the woke, what is it, the woke policy into AI, which is a gross misunderstanding of what we're trying to do here. Just putting guardrail doesn't mean that you know, you're going to be stopping innovation or anything like that, or, you know, install some kind of political. Um, so, is this an AI? But this someone. <laughs> okay, let me see. There is, I can mute whoever is not muted. Oh, I think everyone is. So oh, okay, now everybody is. This um, is uh, uh, that's the AI ghost. <laughs> <laughs> that could be right. Those kind of things happen. <laughs> um. So, but so I think that's that's important. I think students should be exposed to it. I know. I don't believe in the big fear about oh, you know, AI or ChatGPT will destroy schools. I think we need to change the way we teach, and I think is about time. Because I've never been a big fan of like multiple choice or like essay. I think conversation. <laughs> is this? Yeah, but I mean, I, I'm really glad that this um, conversation brought us to also some uh, insights on AI that is um, different from just using it as a tool for ideation, which has been most of the conversation between and among designers so far. Right. It's like, oh, how can I use to generate more versions of this right. possible shape or interface or whatever you that you're designing and that really are we are already um, showing results of of introducing these tools into research, into um persona development into representation into understanding potential impact mm -hmm. of the solutions that we um envision and and stuff like that it's an imperfect imperfect world yes and i agree it's it's worth uh, embracing it as we go and so i hope that this conversation um brought some uh, uh, new insight in this direction or at least invite people to be more um active or proactively discussing within the discipline and outside in the world as uh, the result of what's mm -hmm. happening in this whole new generation of uh, the next generation of product service right, right. If I if there are no more questions, I would and in the respect of time, we mm -hmm. uh, foreseen we are it's one twenty. Um, if there aren't questions or comments, um, we will adjourn. Uh, is there any participant who wants to say anything, Karina? Yeah, it was a interesting interview uh, intervention from Tiziana and Ale Alejandro uh, it was so exciting both of both topics really interesting talk about uh, um, the possibilities and talk about how can we uh, use these technologies and and more most important the ethic the ethics mm -hmm. how can we campaign our students uh, take them by hand <laughs> and showing them what are the, the risk of it and being critical about the the tools that we that we are using and, and are everywhere it is and um, i think also that it is a uh, an amazing opportunity for for the discipline to uh, to create a lot of um, possibilities to improve Mm -hmm. Like the examples that Tiziana gave us of environmental and health, and this is uh, this is real, really, really amazing that we we yeah. can do better a better world. Yes, thank you very much. Hopefully, <laughs> so yeah, uh, like everything, you know, we I feel though it is lacking somewhat in the conversation about AI and ethics. 
um, because it's all about let's avoid the harms, which is crucial. It can be very, very serious, but I feel that it will be even more persuasive if you can actually show the positive at the same time. So it's like, yeah, yeah, it can be dangerous because A, B, and C, but look what else can AI do? And uh, it will kind of balance a little bit, and I think it will get more people interested in the discussion, um, especially if there is more practical example. I talked to a lot of people that were, I wouldn't say scared, but they were concerned, you know, they were like, oh, AI is so technical, I don't want to get involved with it. And so I think by showing really simple examples of, hey, this is AI, you know, you don't need to know how to code, you don't need to be a programmer uh, to do it. It's just amazing opportunities that are out there if we do it right. I agree. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Thank you to, to Karina. I would like to say that Karina is a professor within our faculty. So uh, the um to 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 make these discussions happen and to, to to make them go with with our colleagues and students and the community in general it's very par powerful i'm mm -hmm. so so happy to share with you today and to make these ideas these reflections not only be part of a phd or or an article that nobody's going to read hopefully uh, th these places these platforms I, I value them so much because we can uh, make this knowledge make this reflection go out so for that thank you so much tiziana thank you so much thank Elena. you thank uh, you for your contribution <laughs> was really helpful so. No, thank you so much. <laughs> and I would say, so I would close with this. I think schools and uh, cultural institutions and educational institutions has the role have the role not only to teach our own students, but to promote the conversation on different levels. One is disciplinary, and we will have more uh, forums for discussion. Um, and one is with respect to the to the general public and contribute to the conversation, try to make our insights visible and comprehensible for everyone and try to contribute this way to the growth of uh, culture and, and awareness about possible uh, uh, opportunities and challenges of especially times, challenge, transformative times like this one. So. I invite everyone to stay tuned because both New School of Architecture and Design and the uh, Universita Autonoma de la Baja California, especially Alejandro and Karina's uh, uh, department with uh, industrial design, will organize more events and more actual um, workshop and conversations over the World Design Capital year, which is gonna start very soon. And uh, I thank you everyone for joining with, with to us with us today. And I was I just invite to keep the conversation going and uh, even more trying to experiment some designs. So hope to see you soon and thank you again for the participation. Bye everyone. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>